Greetings, my friends at Restore Community Church. My name is Tobias Ngala, and I come to you today from Chicago. Over the last one year, my family and I have been praying and discerning God's will for our lives. We feel strongly that that door has been opened in Great Britain. The Lord willing, in the month of April next year, we will be joining Restore Community. We believe and pray that together God will use us to reach many more people who are still far from Jesus Christ. Would you take some time, friends, in any way that you can, to pray for us? I have the privilege this morning of reading God's word to us. Now, reading comes from Ephesians chapter 6, from verses 10 to 18. I commence reading. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the word of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. And always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Before we turn it on to Stuart, I'm going to pray for Stuart. Shall we pray? Our God, you love us so much that you bring us your word, your letter of love, reminding us of how much you care for us. This morning, anoint your servant Stuart as he shares God's word so that it would be helpful and it will bring life in our lives, and it will be beneficial in how we walk every day. Thank you this morning. May our hearts be open, may our ears be open, and after hearing this, may we become doers of the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I want to hand it over now to Stuart. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Restore Community Church. Uh, my name's Stuart, and it's great to be here with you again to share God's Word today as we finish our Reframe series uh, by looking at how we reframe the battle that we're in. Now, if you've missed any of the previous weeks, I really recommend go back and listen to the talks, because I think, for me, I've noticed how Ephesians uh, chapters 1 to 6 fit together in a way that I've never noticed before. As we looked at Ephesians 1 to 3, we've looked at the identity um, that we have in Christ and how Christ has won everything for us. And then chapter four and chapter five, and now chapter six, we start to look at how do we respond? How do we live out of that sense of being God's people? And how do we live in a world that, um, as Tobias just read, is actually uh, beset by this battle and a battle that maybe isn't always uh, that obvious to us. I love Jody's message last week that talked about our attitudes being more important than our behaviour. And of course, our attitudes inform our behaviour. A couple of snippets that she said, she said, don't talk rot. Isn't that great? That sense of remember everything that we say is important and let's be speaking things that are really honouring. She said, live a life of love. And I mean, we could spend weeks and weeks just looking at that one phrase. How do we live this life of love? What are the different things that we can do? How do we emulate Jesus in the way that we do that? And I want to start with a quote because I saw this quote this week and I thought, that's really good. Uh, it's by someone called McLaren. It says this, be kind because everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. 
And I'm not one of these people who tends to be uh, overly negative or overly um, kind of just less than positive, really, in life. I tend to think of life as an amazing adventure. But all kind, there's all kinds of battles that each one of us is going through. And we can find ourselves fighting against other people. We can find ourselves fighting at situations, maybe against something around our work or, or around money. We can find ourselves fighting against life itself. And that's really not God's will for us. God's will for us is to have rich, abundant life in him. And yet we get caught up in these battles and we end up not living in all that he has for us. One of the reasons I love Ephesians 6 and I was delighted when they gave me it to speak on today is because it's one of the most visual uh, examples of what it means to stand and to be part of God's kingdom and, uh, and Christians. And so I love the visualness of it and I'm going to be using that to help describe the significance of the battle we're in uh, as we uh, go on this morning. But I wanted to start with a question. I wonder what is the picture that comes to mind when you think about who is God? And what is the picture that comes to mind when you think what is the devil what is the enemy because the bible is very clear it talks about god and it talks about an enemy but we tend to focus uh, mostly on god which is a good thing uh, because we want to become more like him than we do want to be focusing on resisting the enemy but we used this cartoon at the start of lockdown uh, i thought i'd bring it back because it's it gives a sense of the battle we're in uh, and it pictures the devil and god kind of having a conversation over the earth uh, the devil saying, ha ha, I've closed all the churches and God responding with, what are you talking about? I've opened one in every household. Um, and this sense of actually God and the devil aren't right here in the midst of us in the way that we can see them clearly, like we can see other people. There's a sense of them being slightly removed or at least not visible to us in every moment of every day. And so we need to look harder for them. We need to say, what do they look like? And we spend a lot of time worshipping God and focusing on the truth of who he is. And that's right. But if we never think about who the devil is and actually what the devil um, is doing in the world to stir up trouble and to stir up uh, attacks against us, then we'll be caught short. Now, if you know me well, you know that I love Star Wars. And so I'm going to use uh, a picture of some Star Wars baddies to help you start thinking about what the devil might look like. So if you're a Star Wars fan, you can probably start naming some of these. But really, I want you to think about what are the, some of the common themes that join these guys together? Several of them have hidden faces, you'll notice. Others have maybe dark clothing. They mostly look uber serious and maybe a little grumpy. My favourite verse uh, in the Bible, one of them at least, is John 10.10, 10, which says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. But that's not actually the truth. That is half of the verse. John 10.10 10 actually says, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And we tend to ignore the first bit and quote the second bit because it's the nice bit. But it actually is there in one verse together. And the whole point of it is saying that there's an enemy who's trying to steal and kill and destroy your life. But Jesus comes and says, there's another way. And I'm offering you life and life to the full. And it's important we hold those two things together because if we don't, then, and we don't have that awareness of the enemy and the battle that's going on, then we won't be able to take our stand together. Now, there's different images of what it means to take our stand. Um, here's one that I particularly like from last year's Rugby World Cup. Um, it's a picture of the New Zealand All Blacks doing the hacker they always do, intimidating, trying to get into the face of the opposition, uh, trying to win the battle as they often do before the game's even won. And England uh, standing firm together, standing firm, uh, not taking the intimidation, but standing there and giving their own intimidation back. And that sense of the face off, I really like. And I really like the picture of them standing together uh, and of what that symbolizes. Because we're called to stand firm in the promises of God, as the, as the um, passage says to us today. Uh, but it's not something we do on our own. We stand firm together. Now, I'm going to start by reading Ephesians 6, verse 10 and 11 again, because I think this is the verse that most of it uh, is hooked upon. It says the following. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
And so there's three very distinct sections within this. Firstly, we need to be strong in God and his mighty power, not in our own strength. I'm very good at trying to do things in my own strength. That's not what this tells us to do. It says be strong in God and in his mighty power. Secondly, we need to put on the full armour of God. Why? So that we can take our stand. You can't take your stand properly without the full armour of God. And so the second thing is that we need to wear that. And then thirdly, the enemy has schemes. And so we're either aware of those or we're not aware of those. And a picture I got was maybe of a battlefield. Uh, if you like bat war films or battle films, maybe a particular thing comes to mind. But picture a battle. There's people with swords and guns and javelins and uh, body armor on. It's, it's, it's a battle. And there's someone walking through and they haven't realized it's a battle. They've got their sunglasses on, their sun hat, flip flops. They're just sauntering along through the battle. No idea what's going along around them. Do you have any idea how dangerous that is? And yet that's what we do in life as, as Christians. If we're not aware of the battle we're in, we're not actively uh, seeking to stand against the enemy's schemes in our lives, then we're like that person on holiday in the middle of the battle with no idea what's going on. And in the passage, as Tobias read it, there's four times that it talks about taking our stand. In verse 11, it says, that you may be able to stand. Then it says, that you may, may be able to withstand having done everything to stand firm. And then it says, stand therefore. And so we have this posture of standing. It's not an aggressive kind of looking for the enemy and everything, trying to give the devil credit for things that he's actually not due any credit for. And it's, it's not this kind of lying back, oh, it'll be okay, God's got it, he's good. He is good and he does have it, but actually we're still in a battle. And there's a great quote by Eugene Peterson that seems to get this balance of what it means to stand firm. And I want to read that to you now. He says, but there is another way to live, neither on the defensive or the offensive, but to take our stand as Christians, acting and believing out of who we and others are in Christ. Neither in panic before the enemy, nor in a crusade against him. And I love that because it has a really nice sense of what it means to stand firm on God's promises, but not be just going over the top looking for the enemy and everything. And standing firm for you will look different depending on what season you're in and, and what's going on for you right now. Here's some examples of what it might look like. Standing firm might look like for you not being distracted from the dreams God's given you, from the place he's put you, from the things that are in front of you. It might look like standing firm on the blessings that you have, being content, being thankful. It might look like standing firm in the spirit of God, praying in tongues, leaning on God, strengthening yourself in him. It might look like standing firm as part of the church, the body together. It might look like standing firm in truth, holding on to God's promises when there's all kinds of lies and attacks going on around you. And I love uh, how this all links to the living free course that we talk about all the time. Actually, uh, the basic teaching of that talks about how much God loves us. And then secondly, it goes into the sense of two realms. Actually, there's a physical realm, but there's a spiritual realm. And if you didn't quite understand the passage, it's because the passage is all about this. It's saying there's not just a physical realm, but there's a spiritual dimension. And actually, our battle isn't in the physical. It's in the spiritual realm that we need to be taking authority and making our stand for God. And lots of lies will attack us. And that's one of the enemy's biggest things that he'll come at us with. And the thing about lies is you often can't see them coming. There's a hiddenness to them or they just appear in our mind. And we think, is that my thought? Let me give you some examples of how the enemy might have put a lie in your mind somewhere. You might say something like this. You don't know what you're doing. I said that about myself the other day. Um, you're not cut out for this. Why don't you do something that matters? You're wasting your life. You'll never be good enough. You're not as good as them. They're way better than you. Comparison. You might as well give up on that dream. It's not happening. Or God's not with you. He doesn't care about you. Does it sound familiar? Can you recognize any of those in your own life? Because the trick is the enemy will drop a lie in into one of our thoughts and we maybe won't even recognize it. And the Bible says, take every thought captive. If you have a thought and you think that's not from God, don't entertain it. Don't give it space in your life, but rather stand up to it. 
And I want to spend the rest of the, the time this morning talking about what are the weapons uh, that the gospel gives us to fight against these attacks and uh, to stand firm in the battle that God has us. And the uh, passage in Ephesians 6 helpfully gives us this picture of Roman armour. Um, and the, at the time, Paul would have been in prison. He would have been uh, surrounded by uh, Roman soldiers. He would have had a visual in his mind as he's talking about the shield of faith uh, or about the sword of the spirit. He would be very much uh, amidst all of this imagery uh, and he would have seen it regularly. And so I want to talk about the six items uh, this morning, but in three categories, because I think they fit really nicely into them. Firstly, the category I want to talk about is, is our security. So the enemy will want to come and attack us in our place of security. And what do I mean by that? I mean our hearts and our minds, our emotions and our thoughts. And so the armour that God gives us to battle against this is the helmet of salvation to protect our, our minds and the breastplate of righteousness to protect our heart. And why it's important? Well, they're both intrinsically linked. They're both very much a sense of who we are, our identity, exactly what we looked at, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Who are you? Where is your security? Where is your sense of who you are? Someone once said to me, we think with our hearts and we love with our minds. And I thought, no, surely they've got that the wrong way around. But I think they're right. Often we think and are led by the things that are on our hearts, the things that are really important to us, the things that drive us. And yet love is a choice. We choose to love with our minds. But they're intrinsically linked and both of them are really significant. But there's a difference as well. We can know in our minds that God loves us. But if it hasn't dropped those 18 inches into our hearts, then actually it won't have any way near the same amount of impact on how we live and who we live for. To know in your heart that God loves you will change everything. Now, I don't know how you found this uh, last season of lockdown um, emotionally uh, and mentally. Um, I think I, I know a lot of people that have found it really hard. I've found it really hard at times. I think my emotions have been more up and down than they ever have been before. And part of that is uh, just the craziness of the season and everything that's happening. But part of that is the enemy wanting to get in and wanting to use anything to throw us off and attack our sense of identity and who God has called us to be. Um, and so let's have a look at uh, a Bible verse that really uh, brings this to life as we look at standing secure with the breastplate of righteousness uh, and the helmet of salvation. One thing just to note about both of those, both of those are gifts from God. We cannot earn our salvation by ourselves. We cannot earn our righteousness by ourselves. The armour that God gives us to protect our hearts and protect our minds is actually something where we completely have to trust in him. We trust in him for our salvation. We trust in him for our righteousness. And only because of Jesus can we be saved and can we be made right. And as we look to Jesus, as we learn from him, as we put him first, God provides this protection over our hearts and minds. Philippians 4 puts it like this. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God guards our hearts and guards our minds. Actually, I don't know how you found this last season. Maybe it has been a hard time. Maybe your hearts and your minds feel like they've been beset. Well, God wants to give you his peace. And God's peace is powerful. I remember last year, God really spoke to me about the power of his peace. It's one of the strongest things we can pray into a situation. It literally means to destroy the authority attached to chaos. God's peace guards our hearts and guards our minds in Christ Jesus. And so it bring, begs the question, where's your security this morning? And I know I can put my security in a whole load of different things. Our family, work, a sense of calling, um, having a roof over our heads. Lots of things provide security for us, but at the very basic level, it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be that relationship with God and knowing who we are with him. OK, so that's the first one. The helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. And that's all about our security. Secondly, I think God really wants us to be equipped. 
And so the way the enemy wants to come against that is with fear. Now, the armour here is both the shield of faith and the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Again, the link is peace. God doesn't want you to just have peace in terms of your security with him, but he wants you to then take that peace out and share it with others. But I want to talk about the shield first. Um, I happen to be in lots of different WhatsApp groups uh, where prayer requests are a thing. So if someone has something going on, they'll put a prayer request in that group and then a number of people may respond by saying, praying, praying, praying. What I picture when that happens is them saying, I have a shield of faith and I'm lifting it over you and this situation right now. Whatever's going on for you, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to trust God for you. And I'm going to say, yes, this is who God's called us to be in this moment. And if I picture it in terms of Roman shields, I get this kind of picture, which I'm going to show you now. This is called a testudo formation and really uh, was a sense of... Uh, togetherness in a Roman unit. Their armour wouldn't just, their shield wouldn't have just have protected them, but it would very much have protected the people around them. Uh, also, you'll notice there's real strength from them being together. If someone wanders off with their own shield, the group will be that much worse off. But actually, part of us having a shield of faith and believing in God that he answers prayer and can make a difference is actually that we can lift our shields of faith up together and protect one another and stand with one another through whatever's going on. It's a good picture, isn't it? As a church, we don't always get these things right. We don't always stand uh, well enough with one another. And I've been particularly challenged uh, over the last few weeks, um, particularly through the George Floyd uh, incident and, and the pain and everything that's come from that and our response to it as a church. And I just want to say we really, really apologise for where we haven't got it wrong. We haven't got it right and where we've got it wrong. We really want to be a church that stands with those who are mourning, that stands with those who are facing injustice, that stands with those who have no one who will stand with them. And we can only learn and choose to do better. As we go forward, we must do better. Because as God's people, we must fight racism. We must fight injustice. We must fight oppression of all kinds against all people. It's not okay. And we need to say it's not OK on our watch. And part of us having a shield of faith is so that we can lift up our shield over other people and say what you're going through is not OK. And we're standing with you. Help us to do it better. But as for me and my shield, it's with you. And that's part of what the arm is about. The other thing that kind of falls into the category of being equipped uh, talks about the shoes ready to go, ready to share the gospel. And I don't know how you feel about that. I always wonder um, if people in church feel confident that they could, if the opportunity came up, share their faith with someone else. What are the tools? What are the tactics? What are the things that you can help to prepare yourself in advance? Um, there's a good verse, though, I just want to uh, highlight first from 1 Peter 3.15. It says the following. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. Always be prepared. I find that really challenging. I've also had opportunities where I've prayed for an opportunity to speak to someone and God has wonderfully opened up that opportunity only for me to completely fall flat on my face. I had a friend once called James, and I said, God, would you give me a chance to speak to him about you? And we happened to be in the pub, and he said, he turned to me completely out of the blue and said, so what's this, what's this God stuff about then? Why do you go to church? <laughs> and of course, I was completely unprepared, uh, and uh, he, I think he said to me, is it just about being good, or is it more than that? And I think my response was, it's a bit more than that. <laughs> and then the conversation moved, and it was gone, and I'd missed my opportunity to share something of the amazingness of what it means to follow God. And so don't pray for an opportunity unless you're ready. And what are some of the ways that we can be ready to share our faith? Well, I saw um, a really interesting uh, way to be able to share your faith simply the other day, and I want to just share it with you. 
Uh, it's based on kind of three stages. One stage is what, what it was like in your life before you met Jesus. Secondly, what, what happened when you met Jesus? And then what it's like now. And so it may sound something like this. There was a time in my life where I really struggled with self-doubt and didn't know who I was. When I met Jesus, he forgave me and gave me a purpose and a sense of who I was. I now live for him and live to share his amazing message of truth with other people. Have you got a story like that? It's simple. It's less than 30 seconds. And that may be all the time you get before the conversation goes. So I think what the gospel uh, shoes of peace, which mean the ready to share the gospel all about is being ready. And there's other things that you would be scared of doing, jumping out of a plane, bungee jumping. Those are some of mine. Um, but with training and preparation, actually, you could conquer those and you could do those. It's the same way in sharing our faith. If that's something that makes you think, ah, I wouldn't know where to begin. Maybe have a think about what's your story with God? How has he made a difference? How has he moved in your life? I'm always struck by the shoes of peace almost don't fit with the rest of the armour. The rest of the armour is strong and can take a battering, whereas sandals don't seem to be the right combination to go with it. Surely it should be steel uh, capped toes to kick the enemy. But it's not. It's sandals of peace to go. And there's something there about the readiness to step into an opportunity to be able to go where God is leading. Always be ready to share. And so the first one was about our security. The second one was all about being equipped to go. And the last one is all about truth. We have the belt of truth and we have the sword of the spirit. Uh, Don pointed out to me the sword would have gone into the belt. So they're linked nicely from that respect as well. The battle is for truth and the enemy will lie to us he will try and undermine that and he will try and separate us from the truth, maybe just slightly until we head down a different path from what God has for us. But I want to read you another verse from Hebrews 4. It says the following, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, bone and marrow. It judges the thoughts and actions of the heart. I love that description of the Bible being as sharp as a sword. And sometimes if you've read it, you'll know it is. It can be really challenging to read, but there's incredible truth there and there's incredible directness and sharpness there. I want to give you some more passages. And these are passages from the Bible. Um, if you're online and want to check any of them out, a Bible Gateway is a really good um, tool um, it has many different versions of the bible on there but it's also really easy to find uh, the ones you want to look at 1 peter 2 verse 9 says this for you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation god's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light there's something about speaking out god's truth again and again which brings joy to your heart John 1.12 says, yet to all who receive him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 1 Corinthians 12.27, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Anyone this morning who's feeling like, I don't have a part in this, I'm not part of this. Yes, you are. You're the body of Christ. Each one of you has a part. Don't let the enemy lie to you and say you're not part of it. You are. There's a place for everyone. I was talking to someone last week uh, about the difference between guilt and shame. And they were feeling guilt and they were feeling lots of shame. And the guilt was good, but the shame was bad. Because guilt says you did wrong and you may have done wrong. But shame says you are wrong. And that's not true. That's where the enemy would want to come and, and land on our mistakes and say, you're wrong. God can't use you. You're not good enough to be used by him. But God wants to say, that's not true. And he wants us to wear our armour and take our stand for him. There was a time in my life where actually I really needed to stand up in front of some other people. And so I refuse to believe this lie anymore. And I'm going to choose to believe the truth. Um, one particular one for me was... I remember saying, I refuse to believe the lie that I'm not good enough 
to be used by God. Instead, I choose to believe the truth that I am God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for me to do. I don't know if you ever struggle with that sense of purpose or that sense of why you're here or what you should invest your one life in. But we are God's workmanship and he has created things for us to do. We just need to stand firm and be ready to step into them. Now, if you've been watching this morning, you may have noticed uh, a rather interesting fellow sitting on the couch with a bright red hat on. Now, uh, I'm going to invite, I was going to ask for a volunteer, but obviously because you're all watching online, I can't ask for a volunteer. Um, however, if you download the kids' resources this week, you'll notice uh, that there's, for the younger kids, there's a chance to make your own armour uh, from whatever you can find. And I love those shields uh, this morning from the machines that they'd made. Uh, and the older group, you get a chance to make a little uh, armour, armoured knight. Uh, Daniel, why don't you come and join me? So I've asked Daniel to come this morning, mainly to just hammer home this idea of the armour being a visual thing that's really helpful for us to remember. And so we have our centurion here, uh, Daniel, and he's got his full armour on. So can you remember the three areas that we talked about and where the armour is significant? So we're going to start in the middle. We have the helmet and we have the breastplate of righteousness. Both of these are about our security that God would want to make sure we are established and we know who we are in him. Secondly, it was about being equipped. God has a shield for each one of us to lift over one another, to stand with people and say, I'm with you in this. I'm praying for you. I'm going to lift my shield and let's lock our shields together so that we're in agreement and we're praying about this together. And Feet fitted with the gospel of peace that comes from that readiness to share your faith. Actually, the feet represent that this is not just for us. What God's given us is not just for us. The security, the hope we have in Jesus is not just to protect our hearts and minds, but there's a whole load of people in this world who need that same protection, who need us to step out and to share it with them. And then finally, truth, the belt of truth. Have you ever gone out without your belt? It's very important. It holds it all together. You need truth to be something that's right through your life. Hold on fast to truth. And the sword of the spirit, this is quite a mean looking sword, um, I think you'll notice. But your sword will be determined by how well you know your Bible. If you don't know your Bible very well, you might have a tiny little dagger. But the good news is you can grow it. And the more verses you have, the more truths that you can call upon, when you're in the battle, then the stronger you'll be able to be. Because if the enemy comes to you and says, ah, you don't have a place, you can quote the verse that says, actually, we are the body of Christ and each one of us has a part. If, God comes, uh, if the enemy comes at you and says, um, God's never going to use you, you're not good enough. You can use Bible verses to go, hey, that's not true. I'm God's workmanship and he's created good works in advance for us to do. And so there's a battle going on. But I hope this visual is helpful in terms of saying, actually, maybe I need to pray on the armour of God in the morning. Maybe I need to remind myself of the promises that God has for me. Maybe I need to stand firm in the security of what God has for us. Because the devil will attack our identity. So we need to know our salvation and our righteousness. The devil will attack us with fear. So we need to know we have a shield and we have uh, feet ready to go. And the devil will attack us with lies. So we need to make sure God's truth is bound around us and we have a sword with which to fight. I want to finish this morning by reading the last bit uh, from Ephesians 6. It says the following. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And I guess that's my prayer for you this morning, that this armour reminds you of all you have in God, that it equips you to stand and live for him and that it reframes the battle we're in so that we don't feel like punch bags in the world or like we're fighting against life,
but that we know we can stand firm in the promises of God and who he's called us to be. Let's pray together to finish. Father, I want to thank you for the armour you give us. Thank you for your salvation and your righteousness, which is a gift, and your peace, which comes and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Father, would you impart that peace to people watching at home right now? Father, where there's chaos in our lives, where there's battles, we pray, would you give us your peace? Would you strengthen us with your peace so that we might be your people, able to walk that peace out? And Father, would you remind us of the shield of faith we hold, that we can not only lock it together with others, but we can lift it over those who don't have a voice. We can lift it over those who are oppressed. We can lift it over those who are facing oppression or racism or injustice. God, you would remind us of the tools for battle that you've put in our hands this morning. And Father, may we always come back to your truth. May it bind up everything that we are but may we get to know your word so that we may use it to fight the battles in front of us. God, we trust you. We choose to put ourselves in you this morning and to trust that you are with us and that you call us to stand together on the promises of your word. Jesus, would you bless us now? Father, pour your Holy Spirit out, pour your peace out that we may encounter you this morning. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.